personnel. So I'm delighted to be introducing Crispin Day today, who will be delivering his seminar, um, Transformational Parenting, Empowering Parents, Empowering Communities, Foundations, Research and Impact. Crispin is the head of the Centre for Parent and Child Support at the South London Maudsley NHS Trust and the head of the CAMS Research Unit at the IOPPM at King's College London. The focus of Crispin's work is on early intervention and community-based mental health services for children and families. And today, Crispin will be presenting on one such service, Empowering Parents, Empowering Communities, otherwise known as EPEC. So thank you very much, Crispin. Thank you, Emily. And uh, thank you all for giving up your, the early part of your Wednesday evening. Um, I hope it proves to be worthwhile. Uh, so, um, yes, um, uh, thank you for the introduction, Emily. So I have one foot in a university and one foot in the NHS. Um, in the NHS, I work, well, I lead a multidisciplinary group of practitioners from a whole variety of different professional backgrounds and they include service users and the reason that the presence of service users in our team will become evident as I talk about EPEC. Um, uh, and within the NHS and within the university, uh, the group that I lead, uh, uh, we've been responsible for developing a whole range of different uh, parenting programmes, um, one of which I'll talk about this evening. And the, that range of programmes span uh, from um, antenatal uh, interventions through to adolescence. Um, we have some uh, uh, universal based programs uh, that run right through to uh, programs uh, that focus, uh, uh, focus on very discrete high risk populations. Uh, so the w one in particular is called the Helping Families Programme which we've just completed a a randomised control uh, trial, a feasibility trial, looking at the performance of, of that programme with parents with uh, severe interpersonal difficulties um, that would attract a personality disorder diagnosis. Um, and we've used that programme previously with kids, parents whose kids are on the uh, uh, child protection register and so on and so forth. So we've got a range of different things that we that we do. Our main interest though is working with parents as a vehicle for being able to transform the, um, the life chances and outcomes and stimulate the development of their kids. So, um, and I guess uh, one of the reasons for our interest in, in kids and parents is because in my view uh, it is a, an absolute national disgrace that uh, an economy that is the fifth, sixth largest economy in the world, latest DH published uh, survey shows that one in eight of our kids, the kids in our country, suffers from significant uh, emotional and behavioural difficulties. Um, and 50% uh, of those kids uh, will have um, behavioural difficulties, um, often in combination with other uh, difficulties, uh, usually emotional difficulties. Um, and um, where I work, I've worked in uh, South East London for a very long time. Um, clearly the demography of South East London is changing and it's becoming more um, affluent, but still on the estates where we do the majority of our work, that one in three figure can easily be multiplied by three. Uh, so if you're a primary school teacher um, working in some of the harder areas, um, then uh, you're not looking, at if you've got a, a class of um, 30 kids, you know, one in eight kids, that's roughly, what, five kids in the class, but multiply that by three. Uh, so you're looking at somewhere between 10 and 15 kids in your class. And then, you know, it then for me, it's no surprise that in some of the staff rooms that I've s sat in, um, I've just watched teachers burst into tears during the break. That's their break time. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I guess for me, part of this disgrace is 
the immediate effects uh, that these difficulties have on kids' uh, uh, happiness, their ability to concentrate and work in class, um, the uh, types of impacts that it has on their ability to achieve, their ability to uh, be part of a functioning happy family. Um, but there's also the disgrace of the longer-term impacts uh, for kids, that so that kids who develop uh, uh, emotional and behavioural difficulties, particularly the evidence is strongest for behavioural difficulties, but those kids who um, develop difficulties um, living in fragile families, um, they are stepping onto an escalator um, that place them at much higher risk of um, mental health problems, uh, criminal justice difficulties, lack of employment, uh, a lack of economic independence as adults. So the kids that, we, that, that those uh, teachers have in their class are stepping on to an escalator for future difficulties as, the one, as well as the ones that they're experiencing today. Um, and the other side of this coin is that uh, you know, the health economic evidence is strongest uh, in child mental health in relation to behavioural difficulties. Uh, the pattern is slightly different for other, other types of uh, conditions, but there's pretty <coughs> reasonable evidence to show that by the age of 25, uh, those kids with early behavioural difficulties, by the time they're 25, will have consumed services that equate to 10 times the cost of a kid without difficulties. Um, and one of the interesting things is if you lower the threshold, so you move the threshold away from um, kids um, with behavioural disorders and just make it behaviour problems, um, their costs rise by fourfold. So one way of looking at that would be going, oh, if kids with behaviour problems only cost four times the exchequer and services four times, then that's a decent deal in comparison with some kids who are costing the exchequer um, and taxpayer ten times. Um, until you look at the prevalence, and the prevalence of behaviour problems is much more common. So in fact, kids with behaviour problems cost in economic terms, their overall cost burden in, e in economic terms, is the same as the cost of kids at the higher threshold. Um, so I guess one way or t'other, I'm trying to pl uh, paint a, a bleak picture, I guess. Um, uh, and within this bleak picture, there is a glimmer of hope that says um, uh, parenting programmes are an effective intervention. Um, and there's some very uh, well-known uh, brands of parenting programs, particularly those that have been developed in the US and in Australia, like Incredible Years or Triple P. Um, and those interventions have been um, s disseminated at a global scale. They've been disseminated um, uh, a lot in this country. Um, and their performance in the test tube of an RCT says they've got pretty good outcomes although there are some voices on the fringes uh, that say, have a look at the data a bit more closely. Uh, so there's reviews of Triple P, for example, that say that it's not quite as magical as one might assume it to be from some of the, um, uh, their own brand uh, publications. But broadly, and that's why this you know, uh, nice um, continue to uh, support parenting programs as an int effective intervention, particularly for kids with conduct and behavioural difficulties. However, I think that there is a, a, a significant issue when one looks at um, uh, the provision of what is an effective intervention through the lens of that um, uh, school teacher who's got between 10, 15 kids in her classroom who are uh, living in socially disadvantaged communities because the burden, those numbers that, that, that I opened up with 
um, mean that um, families often don't get the help that they want or that they need. That there is this restriction. Here you've got an effective intervention, but it's not available to a large number of families who are suffering the burdens I've been describing. Secondly, um, I'm not sure whether I should say this in public, particularly if it's been recorded, but um, uh, the uh, mental health trust that I work with, we've just been putting an awful lot of effort into uh, a waiting list initiative in order to try and address the needs of people who've been on a waiting list for an extremely long time. So that it's not only there's not enough to go around so some people don't get help, but that a lot of families who want help just simply don't get it at an early enough stage in the development of the difficulty to make a difference. So if you can catch it at the behaviour problem level, you've got more of a chance of altering the trajectory than if you catch it at a later stage. Uh, so, uh, and and in, in, a, in a period of sustained austerity, um, uh, I remain to be convinced by the idea of our services growing and growing and <laughs> growing as, as some of the um, broader views about how the NHS and other services are doing. Need is simply not, um, uh, the, the, the scale of need simply outweighs the capacity, the service capacity to provide. Um, and to, uh, last point is, um, if you try and get help, it's a bloody difficult thing to uh, jump through the hoops uh, required, which necessarily, so that what this adds up to me is that the inverse care law uh, in which people who are most disadvantaged are more likely to suffer from the difficulty are least likely to get help. Uh, so what we need, what our argument is, that you can't just do the same sort of things as we've been doing in order to address these uh, structural problems. Um, because um, certainly in the UK, and if you then move into low and medium sized income uh, countries, uh, there will never be the amount of money available to fuel and fund um, professional service provision. It's not, in our view, it simply is not going to happen. We can wish it, but it's simply not going to happen. Um, so that we need to be designing and trying out systems of delivery of effective interventions that are not solely reliant upon um, uh, professionalised interventions. Um, and... Um, the other thing that we need to do is we need to think about the capacity and resilience and expertise that exists within communities and how to mobilise that to try and make a transformation for other parents within their communities. Um, and that's what we've been attempting to do over quite a long time. With EPEC we developed um, about 15 years ago or so probably a little bit longer. And it's an attempt to try and address some of the problems that I've been laying out. Um, and it, it, our, our starting point was the, of it was when we en enthusiastically set up parenting uh, groups, parenting courses in rooms of this, about this size in uh, parts of uh, uh, Bermondsey and, um, uh, and uh, Peckham and other places places where there were still the original working class communities there. Um, and we set up a ring of chairs, there'd be me and another bonny faced colleague, and we'd wait and we'd wait and we'd wait and no one would turn up and there would be tumbleweed blowing through the ring of chairs <laughs> and a prevailing sense of disappointment that we'd <laughs> that the community had again failed to take advantage of our generous offers of assistance. Um, um, uh, eventually, I was working with a fantastic colleague who's now retired called Caroline Petty, um, and she just went, we've got to do something different. We can't, uh, this is a waste, th this is a waste of time, it's a waste of our time, 
It's a waste of our services time and we're simply not having effect. We've got to find a, uh, another way of doing things. And I, um, I'm not sure at what point Caroline felt she was inspired by Tupperware as a model. Um, but um, that's in essence what we, what we decided to do, um, was that... Um, uh, this is a rather complicated uh, uh, slide. The essence of what we uh, set out to do was for us to no longer... I'm a clinical psychologist, psychologist by background. Caroline was a family therapist and a nurse. Um, and we decided not to try and um, run parenting groups um, because having tramped the uh, balconies of estates in South London and had doors open on me and people just look at me and go, what the hell has come to our front door? Because they looked at me with a complete absence of authenticity. What on earth do I know about their lives? Um, and so our, 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 our predominantly Caroline's brilliant idea was let's train tra parents from those estates, from those communities, those streets, let's train them to deliver parenting groups to other people within that community. We'll develop the manual content so it's kind of ticking some of the right boxes. Um, we will then um, uh, try and choose parents <coughs> who we think <coughs> will be influential, uh, that they'll feel comfortable. We don't want tub thumpers. Uh, we want people who can manage groups of, of, of parents. Um, and we want parents who understand how this particular manual works and therefore how to communicate and mobilise and uh, influence other parents within their communities. Um, and that's, that's the story that I'll tell you um, with some of the kind of nuances of, of what we've been doing. Um, the, uh, where we've got to over that 15-year 15 15 period is that we've now... Uh, we started with uh, an initial core programme which is called Being a Parent, which is for parents of uh, kids aged between 2 and 11. Uh, we then went on to develop uh, another programme called Living with Teenagers, which says what it does on the tin. Um, we have a, a version of uh, for parents who've basically got kids who are not mobile yet. So is it the upper threshold of a year really depends on how stationary the, the, the baby is, because um, the babies attend that group along with the parents whereas they don't. We provide creche facilities, um, certainly for the being a parent group. Um, uh, and over time, our Caroline and I's first effort at developing and, and writing a manual, drawing on the type of evidence that was around at the time, we've refined it over, over years, and we're on about version 7 now. Um, and what's brilliant is that, uh, from our point of view, is the content of that manual has been refined and in modern parlance co-produced with the parents who deliver our, uh, uh, e e e any one of these core programmes. Um, the parent group leaders themselves uh, co-facilitate the, uh, the parent groups in, in pairs, uh, fairly typical format, eight sessions, two hours long, um, and we'll have between 8 and 12 parents within each um, uh, course. Um, they're delivered um, in community locations, so predominantly uh, children's centres, early years centres, schools. Uh, we've delivered them in mosques, in churches, um, anywhere where parents are likely to go. Um, and the core uh, thing, um, I can't remember what I've put a, a slide in, I don't think. The core thing for us is there is a targeting process about the way we organise um, uh, EPEC um, and there's also a universality about it. 
uh, we're particularly interested in connecting with parents from socially disadvantaged and excluded communities. So we predominantly deliver EPEC groups in those communities because we, we want to provide better access for those uh, families for obvious reasons. So the targeting is we'll go there, but we won't go there. We'll go to uh, New Addington in Croydon. Uh, we won't go to the Leafia Glades. Um, once we've got our geographical locations where we know that there are high, there's uh, more challenging demography, then we build the biggest door you could possibly see <coughs> so that families know it's there and that they will walk through it because it looks very attractive. So, you know, I'm, I've worked in child mental health for a very, very long time. And all child mental health services believe in open access because it's in that very, very small door that's opened on Thursday afternoons, if you can catch it. Um, and that works for some things, but our belief is if you want people to use something, you make it blooming obvious that it's there and highly attractive for anyone to walk through. Um, and the radical discovery is there's very, very few people who want to give up the equivalent of 16 hours of their time sitting in a group of other parents chuntering on about parenting unless they really want to be there. Pa parents are highly selective about whether they choose to take up the uh, offer. And uh, I mentioned, um, sorry I'm going off, off piece, but um, I mentioned the other work that we've been doing with another one of our programmes um, that was focused on parents with significant levels of interpersonal difficulties a la personality disorder, if, you, if that's your bag. Um, so we've recently done a, a survey to look at, we use the SAPAS as the instrument for identifying level of interpersonal difficulties. It's a pretty reasonably reliable, robust instrument. So. Um, we thought it would just be interesting to see what proportion of parents who come to our routine, open door, anyone can walk through it, groups, um, who met uh, uh, the criteria for SAPAS, uh, which is equivalent to a, a reasonably robust way of, of identifying personality disorder. It's a smallish sample, it's about 50 parents. 45% of the parents who are walking through the doors to an open access um, parenting group met SAPAS criteria. So for me, that's uh, the reason why I mentioned that is uh, for me it's illustrative of the, of the notion that people, have, if, if you build big open doors that have got a particular purpose, people are bright enough to be able to make decisions <coughs> about whether they want to use it or not. Um, and that there isn't because the fear is that uh, the kind of worried well will all flood in or the middle classes will elbow their way to the front and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll show you some data later to suggest that that doesn't always happen. Right, and uh, over time uh, what we've gone on to do is to create some kind of more, um, uh, more particular types of uh, um, versions of this uh, uh, parenting programme. So... Um, <coughs> Uh, we're at the moment, we're particularly <coughs> concentrating on a version for, par for parents whose kids have been uh, diagnosed as having ADHD. There's another, another uh, version for parents whose kids have been um, uh, uh, diagnosed as having autistic spectrum disorders. And then we're also trying uh, out another version for parents with severe mental health difficulties. Um, right. So uh, our parent group leaders, um, the vast majority of them uh, follow the same route to becoming a parent group leader, and that is that they're a parent who's originally sat in the group uh, feeling fairly desperate um, about how their own parenting and their own kids, uh, and uh, usually uh, <laughs> they, at some point, things begin to change for them. 
um, that they feel better about themselves. Their uh, parenting is less of a, uh, uh, a fight and a struggle and an endurance, and their kids' um, difficulties appear to be dissipating. And at some point, some of those parents think, looking at the parent group, the, the person who facilitates their group, I'd like to be like you. <coughs> I'd, like, I'd like to give something back. I'd like to do what you do. I believe in this thing because it's changed my life. And I now lo no longer feel ground down by it, but I feel like I want to do something. Um, my life is better. Uh, some parents go off and go into employment. Some go on to set their own businessi businesses up. Some come into higher education. And some want to become parent group leaders. And for those, parent, those parents who want to become uh, facilitators, we run a 60-hour um, a training. Uh, so it's a fairly hefty whack of training that we give people. Um, so that's 10 weekly six-hour workshops. Um, we run it where there's a, an accreditation, so many of the parents, it's the first certificate they've ever got, um, either because um, they're... Uh, not unusually white working class people who, who didn't get on with education in this country or they are from migrant communities um, uh, and their formal education suffered as a result of their journey to this country. Um, so they get a fair whack they g uh, of, of training, um, uh, they get an accreditation from it uh, which is fairly demanding. The, the training's demanding because these people are doing an amazing job, a, an extremely important job, which is making, trying to make a difference to kids and families in their communities. So we want them to do it really well. We're not, we're it's, it's not a kind of feel-good thing. Have we got is that half an hour? Great, I told you, see, I've, at least I got to slide seven or something. Um, uh, and we've tested the, uh, uh, the training uh, to see whether it works, and there's a publication uh, that shows that it does. After the training, what we've done is we've built a system that tries to reinforce the quality assurance of what we provide so that the parent group leaders um, are supervised on a fortnightly basis when they're uh, running the groups, their sessions are observed, um, and that they they receive the equivalent of continuing facilitator development. So they'll meet together as a group, uh, which is really, really important, both for their continued learning, but also because uh, our EPEC groups, uh, are we, when we <coughs> create an EPEC team, we call it a hub for some reason. It was my invention. Um, but a, f a hub needs to work as a kind of a really effective way of delivering this thing, it also has to work as a family. We want to create an extended family atmosphere in which um, people like me and the people who are wor work, who are paid salaries to do this, together with the parent group leaders who are generally paid for their, their time, everyone has a sense of belongingness, everyone has a sense of voice, uh, and it's particularly important for many of the parent group leaders because they've they, they have they have fairly fragile life experiences and they can join something where of which they feel a part and they can make a, a, a significant contribution to other people's lives but also get something back um, right uh, uh, for those of you who know more about parenting interventions than I do um, I get into an enormous amount of trouble with my colleagues when I say, uh, in the big scheme of things, there's nothing remarkable about um, the content of EPEC. It covers the sort of things that you would expect. Uh, it draws on attachment, social learning theory, uh, relational stuff, CBT <coughs> ideas, social learning, as I've mentioned, social learning theory. And, and they're very much led by participative um, adult learning styles of, of activities, very activity-based, trying stuff out in the room with the intention of going home and trying out at home, coming back and saying how it's been. Um, and so this is the content uh, for... Sorry, you won't be able to see this. 
I should read it word by word. Um, the, uh, so having scotched the rumour and disappointed my colleagues that there's nothing new under the sun in the content, there is, um, uh, where we start is very much with a focus on the parents, their own experiencing, ex experiences of being parented. We often ask parents to bring along a, a token, a, some sort of object uh, that represents their own experience of being parented within their own culture. Um, and we explore good enough versus perfect parenting and taking care, parents taking care of themselves. And then that segues into a focus on feelings, both parents' feelings, how they manage their feelings, what their feelings are like, and that moves into, that's about ex acknowledging and accepting their own feelings, but also you can see the direct connection between that and the acknowledgement and acceptance of their kids' feelings, and creating a, 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 an emotional literacy, as it were. That moves on to non-directive play um, and interactions and communication that is about the kid and not about the parent. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then we segue into um, more social learning theory stuff to do with rewards and the sort of things that you'd expect from a parenting, a particular a kind of CBT orientated parenting program. And then it closes with uh, more focus on processes of listening and of um, parents looking after themselves. Uh, so in terms of the grand scheme of things, we have lost count of the number of EPEC groups that we've done. We reckon we've pr it's somewhere in around four, five, six hundred courses, most of which have been run in the UK, but we've done some. Uh, we have a couple of sites in Australia who run EPEC in uh, Melbourne and Tasmania. And uh, our reach is, you know, we're in the thousands of, of of parents and, and kids whose parents have attended uh, EPEC courses. And at the moment, we're going through a process. We've al always run with about kind of 10 sites, mainly around London, but um, with a few more distant places in England. And we've got money from um, Nesta, which is Innovations, uh, uh, I think it's charity, I think it is, uh, and the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, they funded us, uh, who knows, but they funded a range of early years programs. Um, and so uh, the funding that we have is to, uh, we've been working with a range of uh, 15 sites across the country to see if they can replicate what we've been doing predominantly down here in London. Um, alongside that, we've got around about 400 um, uh, parent facilitators who we've trained. Um, we come from, a, uh, as you'd expect, come from a very wide range of cultural, ethnic backgrounds, and as a result, uh, the program's been translated into um, uh, uh, French African, um, particularly for the kind of West African French speaking communities, uh, Arabic, Chimbamese, uh, Hindi, Assyrian, Chaldean. Spanish and Vietnamese, the, the, our Aussie colleagues have done an amazing job. In they were, it's a uh, charity that particularly focuses on migrant communities within parts of Melbourne, and they they run the program in Chimbamese, Assyrian, Chaldean, and uh, some of these other languages. It's an amazing piece of work, all generated by the parents themselves. And if you think about the kind of, fun what's fantastic for us, they've, it's been, they've been translated into Japanese at the moment. And what's fantastic about this process is it's not the linguistic translation, it's the cultural uh, tra adaptation that's just so fascinating and so much easier to do when you ha you're working with parents who are both inside the program, but also inside their own cultures. Uh, Right, okay, so hopefully I've softened your hearts up with a description of a kind of meaningful um, and uh, kind of socially inclusive intervention. But um, the other side of this is uh, 
I'm particularly as hard as nails, but so are some of my colleagues, because it's, it's very all very well kind of generating something that looks nice, but does it make a difference? That's absolutely key. Um, the Early Intervention Foundation, which um, many of you will be familiar with, um, says we're an established programme that's consistently effective, um, uh, and there's an Aussie equivalent that also is rated as independently rated as very well. Um, and we've conducted a series of, of studies um, that are centred around an RCT that was published in the BMJ a few years ago. And then what we've been doing since then is uh, running uh, feasibility pilots on some of our um, offshoots, living with teenagers, the homeless one, baby and us. And then the other strand of the work is to then uh, look at, um, so we know how EPEC works in the test tube of an RCT, but what happens when you're doing it without the constraints and selectiveness of, a, of, a, of an RCT? So we have been doing a series of benchmarking studies where we look at the performance of the, uh, of the intervention, both in terms of who comes and what effect it has um, in routine service settings. Um, and then the other thing, uh, if I go back to my colleagues who I dearly love, um, wh when, I when I say there's nothing new in the content here and they all get very shirty, um, what, we are in what we do recognise is that there is a flow that focuses around reflective function and emotional literacy that is uh, not so strongly highlighted within some of the more behaviourally ori orientated programmes and that inspired um, a very good uh, colleague who's a member of the team, Josh Harwood, to then do a study to look um, at the impact of the programme on parental reflective function. And when we set about doing it, it was partly because we couldn't, have, although reflective function is a very kind of fashionable, sexy topic, um, there are no studies that examine the impact of, per, of parenting interventions of this type on reflective function. Um, so we've, so Josh um, brilliantly conducted that and demonstrated that there was impact on some aspects of reflective function and not on others. Please don't ask me what those were because I haven't brought it with me and I cannot remember. Um, uh, so there's some evidence from published trials, quasi-experimental trials, that it has an impact the second issue for me is about whether it is doing what it says on the tin, which is reaching out to communities and parents who have the highest level of disadvantage. Because I've made the pitch about geographical location, but what it, that still works in a place like London where there's such mixed communities, and it could be just the middle classes who live in... Uh, uh, more disadvantaged areas who elbow their way to the front of the queue. I think this, this type of data that's mainly drawn from um, uh, the RCT paints a different picture, which is 75% um, uh, of the parents came from um, uh, minority ethnic communities. Um, 66, so two-thirds of the parents come from the lowest 20% of the population by income. So by most measures, they are a, rel they are a poor, low-income population. In our homeowning obsessed democracy, only one in 10 of the parents does own their own house. 75% are unwaged, 40% lone parents. So for us, we take this as some evidence that we are reaching communities who we desire to. Um, I, I've mentioned this is, um, reinforces the, some of the evidence from our benchmarking study, uh, which uh, the benchmarking study studies generally replicate the, the um, uh, results of the um, RCT. Uh, the, the, so if I say, so I'm kind of quick run through and you can have references for our impact studies. So I'm arguing we do, it does have 
it is an effective way of getting better outcomes. We do reach communities who were designed to. The other thing, particularly when I'm talking with uh, colleagues from more specialist CAMs, um, they kind of go, yeah, but parent, running parenting groups, isn't that unsafe? Shouldn't they have a slightly higher level of professional expertise? Um, and so one of this is data from around about 70 EPEC courses, 800 parents attending these courses. So one question we've said is, are, are, these, are the parent group leaders capable of communicating the content that we want them to communicate? And you can see, um, these are pretty good numbers. Um, this is in terms of improving parents' understanding of parenting, uh, helping them develop the skills, improving their confidence, and mobilising the parents so that they not only will do it in the room, but they'll do it outside of the, of, of the course in their own home. And you can see these numbers are pretty good, uh, saying they're going to do it quite a lot or a great deal, which in my mind, that's why we get the good impact, because that the parent group leaders are capable of doing it. We also ask the parent to give feedback about parent group leaders' competence, their satisfaction with the programme, whether the content is appropriate, whether the group leaders relate to them effectively, and for me, the most important thing, whether they feel motivated by the parent. And again, you can see you know, these are, these are decent sized numbers. These are three quarters of the participants, three quarters of nearly 800 people s give the parent group leaders the highest ratings. Uh, so uh, this final stretch, and I should shut up very, very quickly. Um, what we've been doing over the last two or three years is thinking about how we disseminate this, because it's all very well doing it in one place in South London but the question is whether it's possible to replicate um, the type of commitment that we get from our commissioners, um, the type of recruitment and selection and training that we do, um, whether it's possible to for other people to repl replicate the course quality, and it whether it's possible to continue the system of evaluation that we have developed. Um, so I've mentioned the, the money that we got from the DCMS and Nesta. So um, essentially, that's we've been testing that over the last 18 months so that we've set up trainings for independent hubs to go ahead um, uh, and set up their own EPEC in a whole variety of different places in, the, in, in England. Um, we ask them to make an investment in their hub staffing uh, because we don't want them to, we want them to be committed. So there's a system that we go through to check their, their committedness. Um, uh, we then, uh, we provide them with the training and then we've set up a whole load of online systems as kind of repository for all of the information, manuals, documents they need. We have an online Slack, so it's a, like a social media platform thing where all of the uh, staff and parent group leaders can communicate with each other and with us. Um, uh, and we've built an online um, evaluation system. So um, all we, <laughs> we know, uh, 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 one of the areas is Stockport. We know how many parents are recruited to each of the groups um, that are run in Stockport. And we know the attendance of of each of those parents and the same in Hartlepool or Sheffield or Medway or whatever so we can look at to see how much the the deliver how well the delivery is going and we've also got a, another piece of evaluation that's looking at the ability of hubs to create the family atmosphere that I described um, so as I said they've just, um, uh, 15 sites, they're all up and running. Um, within those sites, they have recruited an additional over 200 parent group leaders um, in a nine month period. It's an amazing job that they've done. And they have a current retention of 64%. Uh, 
Um, and we were banking on them um, having it, because they they've had to do it at real pace. So we were banking on them probably having an initial retention of around half. So they've exceeded that. Um, and the first wave of, of nine sites have now begun deliver, have delivered their first 26 groups, which again, they've done really well with the retention. They've got 70% retention. We average somewhere between 75 and 95% retention. That's completion of the course. And these new sites are doing it at, at their first time they've done this, they've got retention of 70%, which is fantastic. Um, and um, there's a whole load of online uh, evaluation uh, that's set up. This is just basically a replication of the things that we do. So they have uh, each parent who comes to a parenting group has to fill in a, a bunch of outcome measures. Um, and that is, that's working uh, um, very well. Right, okay, given the time, I will shut up, Emily. So what I, what I've been, uh, what I hope I've been able to uh, communicate is um, uh, how we have tried to develop a cost-effective, uh, accessible, peer-led parenting intervention. Um, it's got a very reasonable, it's got now got one of the strongest evidence-based for um, uh, for a UK-based um, parenting program, um, and we've developed a variety of different types of program within the overall umbrella. Um, and it appears at this early stage that it's possible for other people to pick up and run with this uh, in other areas, particularly in socially disadvantaged areas across the country and elsewhere. I'll be quiet now. Thank you. Thank you. Wondering if you could help me with 